You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. All right, good morning. The scripture passage for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year of King Uzziah, death, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, the edges of his robe filling the temple. Winged creatures were stationed around him. Each had six wings. With two they veiled their faces, with two their feet, and with two they flew about. They shouted to each other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. The door frame shook at the sound of their shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. I said, mourn for me, I'm ruined. I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the King, the Lord of heavenly forces. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom should I send, and who will go for us? I said, I'm here, send me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. (laughs) I like to be prepared. In the year of my aunt's death, I saw the Lord at her funeral. It was 2009, and I was 15 years old. My aunt was like my second mom, so her loss hit me very hard, as it did for my entire family. I was this quiet, awkward teenager, so deeply unsure of myself and my place in the world. And although I would not have named it that way at the time, Her funeral was the start of my calling into ministry. I wouldn't come to terms with that for several more years. But that was the very first day that God began to call me to this ridiculous work. (laughs) When I finally stopped ignoring the voice of God calling me, my response was honestly not all that different from the prophet Isaiah's. I was a college freshman at that point. I was pre-med on a fast track to medical school, of all things, a plan which both I and my parents were deeply invested in, as you might imagine. And that year, when I began to feel this tug towards studying biblical scholarship and maybe even going to seminary, I became just like the prophet Isaiah. As a lifelong Methodist and an avid churchgoer my entire life, I had always said to myself, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I will never be a pastor. (laughs) The thought that this could actually be a part of my calling made me feel incredibly lost and not a little bit dramatic. I don't know if you heard the drama in the story that Dan read for us just now, but it was very similar for me. And as it turns out, this is usually how a calling from God goes. Maybe you yourself know a little something about resisting a call. It's important for us to remember that everybody's called, not just pastors. But I think it's safe to say that both Pastor Kyle and myself stand in a pretty long tradition of not-so-faithful disciples (laughs) who, uh, instead of responding to God's call with a yes, said something along the lines of, hell no. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Some of the greatest hits of this phenomenon are people like Moses, who, if you'll remember, encountered a literal burning bush with the very presence of God and said, no thanks. Please send anybody else except for me. Thank you. Then there's the prophet Jeremiah, who responds to God's call by saying, but I'm just a kid. I don't know how to do that. I resonate a lot with that one. And of course, we can't forget the prophet Jonah, whose no to God lands him in the digestive tract of a very big fish, right? 
I'm grateful that my initial no's to God were met with grace instead of whatever happened to Jonah. Around the same time that I was feeling this newly strengthened interest in faith and in church, all my friends at this small Christian university we attended kept asking me separately, Amanda, have you ever thought about becoming a pastor? And after the fifth time this happened, I prayed a little prayer. I said, okay, okay, I hear you. I will look into it. And so I prayed the first of many risky prayers. Just like the prophet Isaiah, I will look into it was my version of here I am, send me. And it totally blew up my life. (laughs) I changed majors, removing myself from this fast track program that I specifically selected this university to participate in. And Um, I scared the living daylights out of my parents uh, because I couldn't articulate what was happening to me. I couldn't tell them why I needed to do this. I just knew that I did. I didn't know what it meant to accept a call from God, to allow God to call the shots instead of making every decision for myself. I didn't know that this was going to be a risky prayer. But it was. It was because it landed me here (laughs) in North Carolina. Um, Through a series of serendipitous events, it became really clear to me that Duke Divinity School was where I needed to be next. And just a quick side note, for those of us who call ourselves Christians, we don't really use the word serendipity. We call it the work of the Holy Spirit instead. (laughs) And the work of the Holy Spirit, it was. In the year that American politics died, I saw the Lord in a Facebook post of all things. It was 2016, you remember the year. I was in my first semester at Duke. It was such a strange time to be uh, a seminary student. It was so tense and it was fractious and it was messy. And I had just committed to myself internally that I would be retiring from youth ministry that year. And for that to make sense, you have to understand something. And that is, I am boring. (laughs) I am an old soul. I'm not a naturally fun person. Like, I have to try to have fun. To be fair, I did tell you that at the beginning. (laughs) As I worked in youth ministry in college, I constantly felt like my gifts just weren't right for that work. I had the, you know, the body of a 22-year-old, but the disposition of an 82-year-old. So it just wasn't working. (laughs) It just wasn't working. So starting the journey felt like, um, this, this seminary journey felt like the time to sort of just like naturally transition out of youth ministry, or so I thought. Because right about that time in a seminary student uh, group online, I saw a posting for a part-time youth ministry position at a church in Apex, North Carolina. I knew I needed a job, and uh, for whatever reason, of the several that were listed on there, this one, was, this one was the one that spoke to me the most. I just kept coming back to it and coming back to it. And um, I, did, I agreed to come in for an interview, uh, after which we, we decided we would give it a try. Uh, at, at that point, both Kyle and I were unsure about how long this arrangement would, would last. <laughs> um, yeah, I was a student. I had a lot on my plate, and he'll deny it now but I don't think he was very sure of me until a couple months in. To be fair to you, I wasn't sure of myself until a couple months in either. Um, When I got started in this work, I really did feel like Isaiah or Moses or Jeremiah. I felt like the wrong person for this job. I'm lost, Isaiah says in our translation. Um, It also says I'm ruined, right? pretty dramatic, but that's how I felt. I didn't know what I was doing. What's interesting is this Hebrew phrase in Isaiah 6 that we read as I am lost or I am ruined can also be translated as I am silenced. You see, most of my life uh, before landing here at the peak, I was incredibly quiet with my family where I was comfortable. That wasn't always the case, but around other people and especially in the church, I was silent. I think it was a combination of just like a naturally sort of shy nature and then this sort of persistent, 
pervasive patriarchy that just swims in the waters of the church even still. But it wasn't just those things. I was quiet, I was silent, because I've also felt the weight of things of faith in my soul for really as long as I can remember. To speak about God, to talk about salvation, to name the things of the Spirit always felt like wading into deep water, and I didn't know how to swim. (laughs) So in many ways, I was lost, I was silenced, and because of that, every single prayer that I prayed felt like a risky one. But ministry here at the peak for me has been about finding my voice. This church has been the burning coal that opened my mouth to speak of the things of God. Because over the last seven years, my voice here, nearly seven years, sorry, excuse me, um, my voice here (laughs) has been met with so much grace and so much gratitude, so much encouragement and so much joy, not just in preaching, but in leading and in learning with you, in dreaming and in hoping for the future. I prayed, send me if you want, and it felt so risky, but that was actually one of the safest prayers I ever could have prayed, because it landed me here at this church which was the safest place I could have been planted. Here I've grown these roots that have given me a foundation to be confident and capable and full of clarity and certainty in my calling in the world. And all of this happened because of the DNA of this place. Some of the most important work you've done and will do as a church is lifting up the voices of those who would otherwise be silent. That's good work. That's holy work. And you did that for me. You taught me. We learned together what it means for us to claim a mission, what it means for us to boldly pray that risky prayer, send us, Lord, and then go wherever God points us. We prayed, send us, and God said, go and gather those who feel disconnected. So we did. We became this deeply honest church, the deeply honest church that God always intended for us to be. We were real together. And we never put on a show, but we led with our hearts first. We became the inclusive church God always intended for us to be. It was hard work. We lost some people along the way. But here we are. And we've gained a lot more people than we lost. And I couldn't be more proud, but more importantly, I think God's pretty proud of that too. We became the connected church God always intended for us to be. What I've learned probably more than anything from you is that connection, community, relationship are all at the heart of who God is. I'm reminded of the work of Richard of St. Victor who wrote extensively about the nature of the Trinity. He claimed that uh, God actually has to be three. God actually has to be triune if God is who we say. For God to be good, God needs to be one. For God to be love, God needs to be two. But for God to be joy, God needs to be three. To experience the joy of what it means to be in community with one another. That is that work of being connected in goodness, in love, and joy. That is our work together. It will always be our work together. And it is the hope that we cling to in the moments that are the hardest. This church taught me what it means not just to pray send me, but to pray send us. And risky though it has been, I can't imagine having done it any other way with anybody else. In the year that normal died, I saw the Lord. It was 2021, exactly one year into the lockdown of the COVID-19 pandemic. I was living in this small townhouse in Raleigh with a roommate who had become like a sister during this incredibly difficult time. We thought we were close before, and then we lived in the same space 24 hours a day for a year. (laughs) Pretty close, pretty close. Looking back now, we were uh, both depressed and struggling quite a lot, Um, but then again, Who wasn't? At that time, the thing that was keeping me afloat mentally and spiritually was my monthly meetings with my spiritual director. 
I had been connecting with her for about two years at that point, and as my favorite theologian, Barbara Brown Taylor, says, it was the thing that was saving my life. We talked about where God might be in all of this, how the pandemic was changing things, how my calling was transforming even in the midst of it. We wondered about the future, and we lamented all of the trauma and the loss, and honestly, we prayed the hell out of me. (laughs) My director was and is the spiritual companion that I needed to make it through the fog of that wilderness On March 25th of that year, I couldn't sleep. And uh, at that point, insomnia wasn't really abnormal. (laughs) I imagine it probably probably wasn't for some of you either. Um, But there was something different about that night, something that was stirring inside of me. As I sometimes do, when I can't sleep, I said a little prayer. Okay, God, if you're talking, I'm listening. Let's get on with it so I can get some sleep. What I didn't realize was at that moment, I accidentally prayed a risky prayer. Have you ever done that? It's the worst. (laughs) Although I didn't say it in so many words, I was opening a door for God to send me through, to push me through. Shortly after I prayed, I was struck by a sudden clarity of vision. I remember sitting straight up in bed and saying out loud, I need to be a spiritual director. And then in response to myself, I said aloud, what in the world does that mean? (laughs) Because this wasn't in the plan. Uh, Before I started meeting with a spiritual director in 2019, I had never even heard of spiritual direction. And much like my own, I assumed that all directors were older, more mature Christians who were these spiritual experts in the faith who had all of this experience and wisdom. And as a reminder, I was 27 years old and depressed, and uh, broke, and (laughs) uh, confused, and super wounded by the world, more so than I had ever been before. And so all of this felt like some kind of cosmic joke. But I couldn't shake it. There's this deep conviction that I knew now what I needed to do. And I also knew that I wasn't being called to do this work alone. One of my best friends from college is a therapist, one of those people who first affirmed and believed my calling into ministry all those years ago. For many years, we we had wondered together about how we might might one day collaborate and do work together. We talked about writing a book or something boring like that. So that night, it was approaching 1 a.m., and I texted my friend, and I said, I know it's late, but I'm having an epiphany. I need to talk to you. And I proceeded to say paragraphs full of thoughts and feelings that I was experiencing, and I said, maybe we can talk about it tomorrow. So I actually went back this week, and I found the text message. You can see it's dated for March 25th, 2021, at 12.34 (laughs) a.m. And uh, for those of you who ever have exchanged messages with me, you're like, this checks out, because there is no such thing as a short text message conversation with Amanda Rigby. Uh, I I write in long form, and I think it's just because I was quiet for so long. I've got a lot to say. But I got a response immediately, 12.34 a.m. They texted me back. It turns out they couldn't sleep either. And we proceeded to work out uh, an entire plan for a practice of spiritual direction and therapy that we would one day launch together. Middle of the night. Took us a couple hours, but we figured it out. Didn't get a lot of sleep, but it didn't matter. We didn't know this, when this would happen. They were living in Iowa at the time, and I uh, wasn't even sure if I could become a spiritual director, so we kind of laid out a whole plan that was um, not immediately possible. But wouldn't you know then that a few days later when I had my monthly session, my director shared with me very casually that her institute for training spiritual directors was beginning to accept applications for a new cohort. And I remember laughing and then, like, crying immediately. Have you ever done one of those? You're like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Just because I couldn't believe how ridiculous the Holy Spirit was in that moment. So that was a little more than two years ago. And let me just tell you that the Holy Spirit has continued to be incredibly ridiculous. Shortly after, just a few months after that epiphany, my friend moved here from Iowa with the hope that we would be able to one day launch this practice together at some point. 
And I was accepted into this spiritual direction program uh, despite being three years younger than the minimum age requirement. And the doors to this dream continued to just be flung open almost without our consent in the best way. Yesterday, um, I graduated from that program. (laughs) So I've shared all of this with you because it feels vitally important for me to say and for you to know two things before I go. First is that I never would have been able to see or understand this vision God gave me for what was next if I had not learned how to pray these risky prayers with you. I would have missed the gift of this dream if you had not taught me how to dream these big, bold, stupid dreams with God. (laughs) I would have lost the chance to open all of these doors if you had not been one big open door for me. So if there's any fruit in this next phase of ministry, which because of the ridiculous Holy Spirit, there will be, it is also yours. It also belongs to you. So thank you. The second thing uh, is just as important, um, and that is this. There really isn't such a thing as a risky prayer. I know that seems hypocritical because we've just spent the last eight weeks telling you about all the risky (laughs) prayers that you could pray. Just bear with me. What I mean is that, yes, there are so many prayers that you you can pray that will lead to these completely unexpected outcomes. All we have to know Uh, All we have to do to know this is true is just ask the prophets. You can ask Moses, ask Jeremiah, ask Jonah. There are prayers that will cost you some of the most important things in your life. Prayers that will take you far from everything you know and love and into an unknown that you never would have chosen for yourself. There are prayers that will absolutely blow up your life or turn it upside down or transform you completely. There are even prayers that will break your heart wide open so completely that the whole world falls in, as Mother Teresa would say. Those prayers are painful. They're hard. All these prayers, but none of them are risky because if we can figure out how to actually mean them, they're only risky in the world as we see it and know it now. What I've learned is that with the God that we love and worship and serve, it is far riskier to cease praying, to stop hoping to quit dreaming about the world as it could be, as it should be, the world as God has always intended for it to be. So the invitation today is to pray this risky prayer for God to send you. Because I'm living proof that it might cost a lot and it might not be what you expect, but in the best kind of paradoxical way, this is actually one of the safest prayers you can pray if, if you truly want to be a part of what God is doing to save the world. Thank you for listening to The Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.